going to start with a bit of humor, not to trivialize matters, but to uh, try to make a point. Uh, there's an old military joke about soldiers being out in the field for six weeks, uh, living in the grime, living in the ditches, unable to shower, unable to change clothes, and they come back to the barracks. They're ordered into the main barracks, and the general comes to the front of the room and says to the soldiers, I have some good news and some bad news. What do you want to hear? Everyone says, the good news. We want the good news. He says, okay, the good news is, Today, we change underwear. Everybody celebrates. Yes, today we change underwear. The bad news is, you change with you, you change with you, <laughs> you change with you. So uh, we, th we thought that a uh, piece of humor is quite revealing about how the whole system of indoctrination works. Uh, we're often given surface level good news, good news in quotes, and uh, there's a hidden bad news that always accompanies it. And uh, to start, we would like to talk about the war against the poor in the United States uh, in relation to uh, so-called good news and bad news. Uh, there's a quote in the New York Times that says that the Republican plan to abolish AFDC rests on a huge and risky leap of faith. The plan heading for President Clinton's desk would turn over welfare to the states with less money and strict time limits on benefits. Most people could receive no more than five years of aid throughout their lives, and most states would probably set limits much lower. Those changes would be accompanied by significant reductions in food stamps, Medicaid, housing, and disability programs. And John's going to continue. No, I just want to ask why um, it's so easy for middle-class Americans to allow this to continue. Why it's so easy to beat up on the poor, so to speak? Well, first of all, on the quote, this statement that uh, it's a leap of faith is pure propaganda. Uh, nobody has any doubt how it's going to turn out, including the people who are... Uh, uh, I mean, it's as if somebody were to say, when the Nazis put Jews in concentration camps, it was with a huge leap of faith that they would be happier in there. Yeah, maybe somebody talked himself into that, but it's not a leap of faith. They know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the purpose of moving things down to the state level and cutting funds is to ensure that as little as possible gets to poorer people. Well, now, what is it that allows the wealthier sectors to agree to this? Here you have to be a little cautious. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, for these people, it's obvious what it does. They get more money in their pocket. If you're trying to enrich yourself and you want the state to be a powerful welfare state for the rich and nothing else, the Gingrich Heritage Foundation Army system, uh, including our governor, if that's what you want, well, this is fine. I mean, you just uh, crush poor people because they don't do any good for you. It's like uh, social cleansing in Colombia. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the general population, attitudes are somewhat more complicated. For example, a large majority of the population uh, thinks that it's the responsibility of the government to assist poor people who need help. Uh, in fact, a substantial proportion, last time I looked at a poll, it was a majority, are willing to raise taxes uh, to, f to help poor people overseas. Uh, so the idea that uh, you should you have a responsibility to help poor people, that's very widespread. On the other hand, uh, the polls also show strong opposition to welfare. So the same people who say it's the responsibility of the government to help the poor uh, are opposed to welfare. And the reason is because there, it sounds contradictory, but it isn't, I don't think, if you look at the propaganda that people are being fed. Uh, the propaganda is that welfare does not go to help poor people. Welfare, welfare goes to uh, keep uh, you know, rich black women breeding like rabbits and driving Cadillacs. Well, I don't want my money to go for that. You know? So yes, uh, I'd like to have money go to help the poor, but not welfare. And similarly with foreign aid. I don't want to give those people money for, you know, rich people who are going to just hate America. If it could go to poor people in Africa, fine. You know. uh, now, here's where the propaganda has been successful in dissociating the actual facts about welfare and aid from the idea that you have a responsibility to help people. 
Now, like in, as in any propaganda, it's not totally falsified. So an awful lot of foreign aid is putting money in the pockets of rich people. And uh, a lot of what's, I mean, even what they call welfare, which is a very narrow part of welfare, um, you can find welfare fraud and so on and so forth. But I mean, even the most crazy propaganda, say Hitler's propaganda about the Jews, had, had some fringe of plausibility or else you couldn't get anybody to accept it. Uh, the propaganda is more elaborated in the rest of that story, if I remember it. Uh, it starts by saying that everyone agrees, even liberals, that AFDC has been a total failure uh, and that it has uh, not gotten rid of poverty and so on and so forth. Well, that may be what the uh, author of the article and whoever's giving him his lines believes, but it's certainly not a fact that people who know anything should believe, because it's just not true. Uh, the fact is that AF the, what failed about AFDC is that it was eliminated. Uh, AFDC, which was never very high, uh, has been cut back by close to 50 percent since around 1970. You, go, you take a look at AFDC in real terms from 1970 to, say, 1990 through the Reagan years, it's down a, close to half. Uh, in fact, it got to the point where it was lower. Uh, uh, all, all such payments, AFDC, food stamps, and uh, I forget the third, third one, were lower than just food stamps alone. Uh, before this period. So sure, if you cut down support systems for poor people, uh, you're going to have a lot of poor people. That's for sure. Uh, so one factor in the fact that we haven't gotten rid of pro poverty is that the so-called war on poverty was called off right away. Uh, it, in fact, didn't go into effect until the late 60s. And, it was, and by the end of Nixon's term, it was over. And Nixon was sort of the last liberal president, you know, uh, even toward the end of his term was being attenuated. But when you get into Carter, Reagan, and so on, that's the end. It just goes down, down, down. So yes, uh, uh, these programs didn't have much effect because they were never applied. Uh, now they had some effect, you know, like some poor children did, did get enough food to eat. Uh, but, uh, uh, and in fact, there were uh, the, the effect of cutting them down is quite marked, or at least you know, cause-effect relations are hard to determine, but at least this much is correct. Several years after the decline in welfare, as welfare declines, you know, regularly, steadily, as it has been doing since around 1970, uh, a couple of years later you get an increase in broken families, child abuse, uh, illegitimate births, and so on and so forth. Now, whether that's a cause-effect relation or a before-after relation, you can argue, but there is a temporal relation, at least, between cutting back of support systems and disruption of families. And that's not, I think you can imagine why that should be. Uh, and it gets worse. Uh, and suddenly there's another factor intervening which overwhelms all of them, and that is that starting around that same time, uh, real wages began to stagnate. And from 1980, they've been going down. And for poorer people, much further down. Uh, and for younger people, even worse. So, say, entry-level wages, you know, your first job. Uh, let see if I can remember the numbers, but for males, it's dropped about 30%, I think, since 1980. And for females, I think it's dropped about 18%. Well, that's, you know, that's a steady effect on your long-term future. Uh, meanwhile, real wages have been going down steadily. Uh, high school graduates, which is probably 70 percent of the workforce or so, it's what they call non-skilled workers, funny term for it, but a uh, considerable majority of the workforce, something like 70 or 75 percent have lost, uh, males have lost about, I think, over 20 percent of their purchase, of their income since about 1980. Uh, now, uh, furthermore, uh, this has had an effect, this has had the effect of driving a second parent into the workforce. Uh, you know, if women want to work, that's fine. But this is forcing them into the workforce when they don't want to go in, because you have to have food to put on the table. So you have two parents in the workforce to try to keep at least family income steady. Uh, uh, support systems are collapsing. Uh, hours of work are increasing. So by the early 90s, it took two hours more, two weeks more of work a year to make a 1980 salary. So you have two people working 
very heavily to just try to keep things going. Uh, no support systems. Uh, if they get in trouble, like say it's an abused teenager and she can't live with her parents and she goes off somewhere to try to get some help, that kind of payment is going way down. Well, what's the effect of all of that stuff going to be? Well, you don't have to be a genius to predict. I mean, what it's going to mean is uh, child abuse, uh, neglect of children, uh, malnutrition, uh, violence against children, by children, drug abuse, uh, uh, unwanted pregnancies, all sorts of things. In fact, all of these consequences uh, are exactly what has been the clear, determinable result of social policy by the people who call themselves conservatives. Uh, they have been fighting a war against families and children, and it goes back to the early 70s. Uh, the propaganda that people are being fed is what you read in that article, that it was a failure of the attempt to, to deal with these problems. On the contrary, it was a conscious attempt to create those problems, and I say conscious in the sense in which you use the term you know, in law. I mean, if a consequence is completely predictable to a sane person, that's evidence for intent. Uh, and this was all completely predictable to a sane person, just as it is completely predictable to a sane person that, this, uh, that these changes that you quoted in your first statement uh, are going to have very severe effects, which means it's equally clear that when he said uh, it's a gamble, that's just not true. There's no gamble, you know exactly what's going to happen. It is a cover for something else. Well, when you have that kind of propaganda, and that's what's being, I mean, this is what's being given to the, you know, the educated folks, so it's in big words in the New York Times, we can review, but you're getting it at some level over and over again, everywhere, from television sitcoms to, you know, um, radio sound bites to advertising to schools to everything. People are being deluged with this propaganda. As a result, they probably believe that uh, the war on poverty was a failure. Uh, and that it didn't get rid of welfare. And uh, all these things that the author there says everyone believes, yeah, sure, that's what you would believe if you were totally subordinated to the propaganda system and you didn't have a way to think yourself out of it. Now, most people don't, but the author of that article does. He knows enough, or at least could know enough easily, to find out just what happened to the war on poverty. So what happened to AFDC? He can find out the answer to that question. That's his field. He covers those things. Uh, so he can find it out, and as soon as he finds it out, he knows what he wrote is, to put it charitably, nonsense, to put it probably accurately, something much worse. Well, the end result of this is you get the kind of confusions you're talking about, uh, that we were talking about. Yes, we should help the poor, and it's the government's responsibility to do it, but welfare is a catastrophe. It's created poverty. Another part of the war against the poor is the increase in prisons. Uh, on the surface, they tell you that the good news is that's going to end crime, putting more police in the streets and building more prisons. Uh, one of the pitfalls quoted in the New York Times last Friday uh, was that uh, there will be overly generous contracts to private prisons uh, that are now being built and uh, the hiring of companies that are difficult for the government to supervise. I was wondering what the effects of the privatization of prisons might be. Could that lead to the privatization of punishment? Well, first of all, I, I don't know what article you're quoting, but it was Friday. It was probably a report on the latest figures on number of prisoners, which last year increased. There was a record increase last year for the federal and state prisons. It's been going up quite steadily since 1980. Uh, but last year was the record increase. I think it's now uh, something like 550 per 100,000, something like that. Uh, it was around 100 per 100,000 or some such number back then. I may have the numbers a little off, but that scale. Uh, the United States has been oscillating for first or second place in proportion of the uh, prison population, uh, of the population in prison. By the late 80s, the United States was in first place. It had passed South Africa quite a few years before, and it had passed Russia. Uh, after the uh, so-called capitalist reforms took over in Russia, the prison population there shot up. And for the early 90s, the U.S. was in second place. Russia was ahead of us. Uh, this year, 
because of this increase, the United States is back in first place. So now the United States locks up more of its population than any country in the world. Uh, and that's rising fast. Uh, in fact, if you project, people talk about projecting Medicare and what a catastrophe it'll be. Well, try projecting prisons. Uh, that's going up much faster. Uh, and if you continue to project that, every you can show every cent in you know in the federal in the budgets are going to be spent for prisons. In fact, Rand Corporation actually did it for California a couple of years ago, and predicted that at the current rate of increase of prisons there, uh, the state budget would be entirely used for prisons, uh, meaning they have to cut back education, which is the thing you cut first. Uh, to some, either to the bone or maybe even to zero after not very many years. Uh, part of this uh, increase, the, the increase in prisons has nothing to do with crime as far as anybody knows. The level of crime has been fairly constant. Violent crime, other crimes, I mean, you know, there's shifts around and, uh, and so on, but there's certainly been no big change, according to FBI statistics at least. It's been quite constant for a long time. Uh, throughout this whole period of increase in prisons, it's been constant. Furthermore, if you look at the constitution of the prison population, you see there's almost nothing to do with crime. Uh, I don't want to guess the numbers because I may get them a little wrong, but a large portion, um, I think it's a majority in the state prisons and maybe a third in the federal prisons, are there for what they call drug crimes. Well, drug crimes are often victimless crimes. It means you catch a kid with a joint in his pocket. Uh, so, so there are plenty of victimless crimes. Uh, which are filling up the prisons. And I think that, again, you have to assume that uh, the predictable results of a policy are the intended results. Uh, this looks like a form of social cleansing. Now, these aren't random people who are being picked up. These are blacks and Hispanics, the kind of people you don't, I mean, the, the exact same people you're going after with uh, uh, the cuts in uh, social service systems. So it all seems to me a natural form of social cleansing. You know, like we're a civilized country, so we don't send out death squads to murder them in the streets uh, the way we arm the Colombian police and military to do. Uh, we do it a different way. Uh, we kick them out of the city like they can't live in New York because there's no room for them or no support for them, or we throw them in jail. Uh, and the drug war is a terrific way to do that. Uh, the drug war has no effect on drug use except to send drug prices up, uh, but it, uh, it does give you a very good way of criminalizing a large part of the population and getting rid of them. All right, now coming to privatization, uh, the prison system is by now a substantial part of the state system. It's not of the scale of the Pentagon, you know, but it's substantial and growing. Uh, and the way our society works is uh, the state is a welfare state for the rich. That's its fundamental purpose. It's always been that way, but it's been extreme since the 1940s. It's a welfare state for the rich, and there are big components, typically the security systems, which are ways of funneling public resources to the wealthy. The building we're sitting in is a small part of that system. Uh, MIT is part of the funnel by which public funds get transferred to uh, owners and managers and investors in high-tech industry. That's what it's there for. That's why I get a salary, ultimately. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, OK, here's another big part. That's exactly why Newt Gingrich and the Heritage Foundation and the people who call themselves conservatives want to, are increasing the Pentagon budget, because they're increasing the system of state support for the rich, public welfare for the rich. They want that. They plainly want it to be not only big, but huge, as it's been in the past. Well, here's another system coming along. Uh, not on the scale of the Pentagon, but substantial. Uh, a growing, and it's a security system, so it's just the right kind of thing. It punishes people, and it also, uh, uh, tra uh, and it does involve resource transfers. So building prisons costs money, and there are people who make that money. Uh, for example, the construction business, uh, or uh, 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 lawyers, uh, or law firms, or investment firms. So for example, now the big investment houses like Merrill Lynch and so on are floating bonds for prison construction. And that's a fairly lucrative business. Uh, the privatization is now substantial. Uh, the, uh, since somebody's going to, it's just like privatization of aircraft. I mean, in the, in the aircraft, the aircraft industry is called a civilian industry. So Boeing is called the biggest civilian exporter. 
but this doesn't even approach being a joke. I mean, these are publicly subsidized private profit systems. Public pays the costs uh, through the Pentagon system of, uh, you know, the uh, avionics and the metallurgy and, uh, you know, just about everything. Uh, and then it's put together by Boeing and they make a, you know, the thing you fly in when you're going to, to California which is a modification of some military aircraft and using all the technology and from, from the military aircraft, which the public paid for. Uh, then, uh, well, uh, that's what we call private, private industry. And that's most of industry. It's not, I mean, aeronautical industry is a dramatic case, but the same is true of computers and electronics and pharmaceuticals, in fact, and just about everything. Well, okay, here's another one. Uh, here's a uh, growing uh, security system uh, which is putting a lot of public funds in it, going up very fast. Well, okay, that has to enrich the same people. So therefore, not only do we get the big investment firms and the construction industry, uh, but let's get set up private corporations who the public can pay to run these people. Uh, that's private prisons, and that's growing very fast. Uh, the concern about uh, not supervising them is about as much like the gamble about welfare. You're not supposed to. The point is, they're supposed to. These are private enterprises. Private enterprise works just the way Milton Friedman says: you give the worst possible service at the highest possible profit. That's what it means to be in the business. If you try to be benevolent, you're out of the business because somebody undercuts you. So the nature of the system, as good insight goes way back to Adam Smith, is to be as mean and rotten as you can uh, to try to maximize profit and market share and give the worst possible service. Same with HMOs and everything else. That's the nature of a, you can't call it a capitalist system because there's too much state subsidy to it. But insofar as it is a capitalist institution, that's the way it behaves. So of course they'll give the worst possible care and the worst possible treatment and so on. Sure, that's the way you make profit. Uh, that's the goal. Of it. it also incidentally creates a slave labor force. Uh, so there's now a growing labor force which other businesses can use, uh, which they do. They've been doing it for quite a while, but it's growing fast. Uh, here is a controlled labor force. They're not going to unionize. They're not going to cause you any trouble. You don't have to pay them much. You don't have to worry about benefits. The public's paying all that stuff to the extent that anything's going. You just have this cheap labor force, which is not only good money, but you can use it to undercut your own labor force because you can transfer. Uh, you can transfer. Uh, jobs over there. It's like, it's like what they call workfare, you know, taking women who are raising children and therefore not working because everybody knows that's not work, that's just fun. So they take women who are doing nothing, you know, like just raising their children and force them to do work, real work, you know, like cleaning streets or something like that, uh, which uh, has a, a good punitive effect, uh, but also it, also, it uh, undercuts other workers because you don't pay them union wages. In fact, you don't. Uh, so that, is, and the same is true of the private prisons and the growth of prisons and so on. Incidentally, there's another angle to this. Uh, the prison system has gotten big enough so that the high-tech companies have taken notice, uh, and they are considering ways of ripping off the public through the prison system the same way they do through the Pentagon. That is, develop high technology control and surveillance systems uh, that can be used to deal with the prison population, and that just is another scam by which the public will pay for high technology. So if you figure out how to monitor people with supercomputers and, you know, you stick electrodes into them so they walk the wrong direction, they get a shock, and the supercomputer tells you where they're supposed to be and so on, uh, that's about, a, I mean, about as useful as an F-22, you know. Uh, it's a, a way of getting more public funds into dual-use technology technology that can be used, yes, for control and surveillance and smashing people up and so on, but is really intended to make profit in the so-called private economy and the and what there is of a market economy after the public's paid for it. And that's going up, too. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the Wall Street Journal already had a, an article on the opportunities for uh, high-tech companies, and they went through, I forget which ones, but the big military companies, so-called defense companies. Uh, turning to uh, prison surveillance and control as a new way of, uh, you know, using their resources, meaning getting money out of the public. So all of this stuff goes together, and in a way it's a small-scale Pentagon. 
uh, the Pentagon has the side use of beating people up overseas, and this has the side use of controlling them internally. Uh, but uh, that's exactly what you'd expect to grow. In a, in, uh, this is all part of a bigger pattern. Social policy designed to turn the country into a kind of a third world. I mean, you take a look at a standard, typical third world country, meaning a country that's been a Western colony, uh, either us or the British or somebody like that for, you know, for long periods of time, they all have pretty much the same structure. Uh, they have a, uh, a small sector, usually quite small sector of very wealthy people. I mean, super rich people, you know, maybe more than here. Uh, uh, they have, uh, these are the people who are mostly linked to foreign investors either the local big landowners or they work for some foreign corporation or the, you know, they run the local bank or whatever it is. Uh, they're linked to the international system that controls the thing. And they may be extremely well off. Uh, the there's a class of intellectuals who are usually also pretty well off. Some of them are, consider themselves dissidents, but they live very, and maybe even are, but they tend to live quite well, uh, you know, remarkably so, in fact. And then there's a periphery around them, you know, lawyers and doctors and so on, who serve service groups for those sectors. Well, that's a small sector of the population. Then comes a really big sector of the population, which is suffering or in misery, depending on where you are. Uh, and then there's usually just superfluous people. I mean, there's street waifs, uh, you know, kids sniffing glue on street corners, or the ones you send the... Uh, paramilitary forces after for social cleansing or the death squads or kick them out into the, you know, into the desert or something like that. Uh, that so th there's these categories and that's where we're moving. Uh, the category of superfluous people here are the ones who are getting locked up. And of course that's growing because social policy has been designed to create more and more of a third world structure. So yes, you're going to get this sector and you have to do something with them. And you might as well do something with them that private, indus that private industry can make money out of. If you, just, if, if you send death squads out after them, first of all, you know, we're too civilized to do that. We only do it in other countries. Uh, but also, nobody's going to make any money out of it. Stick them in jail, it's actually profit making. And the jails are, uh, they're, they're other sort of, I don't know, sort of cultural factors, I guess. I mean, if you want, when you're turning people, the country, into a third world country, you know that people aren't going to like it. Uh, and you want to make sure that they don't do anything about it that's constructive. And there's a technique for that, too. Get them to hate each other, to be afraid of each other, you know, to uh, be terrified, and so on and so forth. And building up the perception of crime is a very good way to do this. People are, crime is serious, but the, as I say, it hasn't really changed for a long time. And most of the crime is poor people attacking each other. You know, the extent to which rich people are affected by crime is rather slight, but yet the fear of crime has gone up very fast. And of course, fear of crime has good side effects, because crime is a code word, which means black or Hispanic or one of those bad gene guys. Uh, so you get uh, people to f be authentically frightened, and you can understand the fright, of the right kind of people. It's like, it's like uh, Jew people in Germany fearing Jews. You know, you want, to get, you want to get them to not pay attention to what you're doing to them, fine, let them hate the Jews, blame it on them. So here, okay, we'll let them hate the blacks and the immigrants and the Hispanics and so on, and look how dangerous they are. We have to throw them all in jail, and besides, uh, they're killing each other and they're killing us, and if we don't throw them in jail, this is what they're going to do. Uh, so it, it increases that. And then you can feed on this by being extremely punitive. Uh, the United States is one of the very few countries that has a death penalty, and it's gone up. Uh, furthermore, the new... The U.S. has been seriously condemned by the International Human Rights Monitors uh, for its inhuman prison conditions, which are an international scandal, uh, uh, and they're getting worse. I mean, it's now back to the days of chain gangs, literally. Uh, the state of Alabama or Mississippi, one or the other, I forget, is advertising the fact and proud of it, you know, that they're putting people in chains and taking them out to break rocks, and they're even shipping in the rocks to be broke, they don't want the rocks broken, but it's a way of punishing people. Uh, and that appeals to the, that engenders the same fear and anger in the general population that you're trying to engender. Uh, 
uh, so that people will hate each other and be afraid and so on instead of cooperating, realizing, look, we've all got the same problem. Let's go after those guys who are causing the problem. That has to be prevented. Now, any system of, the, of control understands this, whether it's a totalitarian state or one with a democratic framework. They still understand that point. That's a general fact about control, and this is a terrific way to do it. Uh, Noam, could you briefly talk about the reemergence of the conditions that Charles Dickens wrote about at the, in the late 18th century, early 19th century? Um, you mentioned debtors' prisons, I think. There are other factors involved in social control that occurred around those, that time. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that? Well, there was actually a study done of that in England, just the right place, by a very old and highly respected charity uh, that goes back to the mid-19th century, queen as sponsor and that sort of thing. Uh, they did a study of the nutritional level of children in England on benefits, welfare. I think it's about a quarter of children. And they found that their nutritional level was lower than it was in workhouses uh, in the, for children, orphans, in, the, in Dickens' years. Uh, so that's an example. It's the idea we're going back to it is not, uh, uh, you know, it's not just some metaphor. Okay, getting back to the surface good news and uh, what lies beneath it. Uh, I think n no word has been used more in the last few weeks than peace. Uh, headlines all over the place. For peace, peacemakers, perils. President promises mission of peace, no troops, no peace, etc. So the good news seems to be that the United States is embarking on a mission of peace in Bosnia. What's, what's really going on here? Uh, well, the U.S. has been standing on the sidelines pretty much while the whole Balkans affair erupted. Uh, the reason is that getting involved would be costly and difficult and uh, uh, no immediate gain from it. Uh, meanwhile, sort of behind the scenes, there have been various conflicts between Europe and the United States, for one thing, on just how to work this thing out. Uh, and what the U.S. has apparently been doing, we don't have documents on this, so you kind of have to reconstruct. So I'm speculating. Well, it looks to me what's been going on for the last couple of years is the U.S. has been standing around waiting, let the Europeans do the dirty work, let them be on the front line. We'll carp and criticize. No proposals except we'll bomb somebody if you like, uh, and uh, from a safe distance, incidentally. Uh, and th meanwhile, the U.S. has been building up Croatian military forces probably building up other, others, at least Albania, uh, and moving towards trying to set up a situation in which Bosnia can be effectively partitioned between greater Croatia and greater Serbia. Now, in a certain sense, that was also the European plan, but somewhat different. Uh, anyhow, the U.S. has been waiting for that, things to get to that stage. It finally sufficient, armed Croatia sufficiently uh, so that it was able to set that stage up on the ground. The arms are, of course, illegal and everything, but nobody pays any attention to that. Uh, there's now, they've now forged a, what they call a Croatian-Bosnian Bosni federation, but that means Croatian-dominated federation, and sooner or later it'll be part of Croatia. President Tudjman has said as much, and it's in the cards. Uh, the Serb Republic that's being set up will sooner or later become part of Serbia. Uh, Bosnia may have some name, but it'll be partitioned. Uh, well, that's sort of in the cards now, uh, and the, uh, that me makes it possible for the, for the U.S. to enter as a pure military force, which will essentially try to separate two warring armies. Now, that's about the only job that the U.S. can undertake. The U.S. has a unique military, at least unusual, maybe unique military doctrine. Uh, for one thing, U.S. forces can't be under any other command. This is called NATO, but it means U.S. So they're under U.S. command. But the other and more important thing is that U.S. forces can't come under any risk. Uh, other countries don't have that. So like when Canada or Ireland or Norway or you know, the Fiji Islands or somebody send peacekeeping troops, uh, they, uh, they recognize that they're going to be facing a certain degree of risk. Uh, and since they are in a civilian environment, they can't respond with massive force. 
Now, the U.S. doesn't accept that. Uh, if a teenager looks at you in a funny way, you call out the helicopter gunships. Uh, that's why Somalia ended up the way it did, uh, with teenagers with rifles. Uh, and I think it ended up with about a couple of dozen Americans killed and somewhere between 7,500 and 10,000 Somali civilians killed. Yeah, that's what happens if you call out the helicopter gunships if somebody looks at you a funny way. Well, those are U.S. ground rules. And that was made explicit in the Bosnia case. Uh, the president, the national security advisor, uh, secretary of defense, when they announced it, said that the U.S. will follow robust rules of engagement, none of this European-style pussyfooting. As Anthony Lake put it, if anyone fools around with our forces, we're going to hit them, hit them hard and immediately, and use deadly force, the secretary of defense added, uh, you know, and then some, as Clinton put it. So anybody should understand that you don't look at us in an odd way or else you get smashed. Uh, so there's nothing about peacekeeping. It's just pure military force with deadly force at its command the minute it feels anything's out of sight. What you hope is, as they said, this will sufficiently intimidate people so that they will accept the regime that we've pretty much worked out, which is in fact the partition of Bosnia between Serbia and Croatia. Uh, Croatia is already pretty much a U.S. client. I think they anticipate that down the road the same will be true of Serbia. So there'll be, just as there are U.S. military missions in Croatia, they'll sooner or later be there in Serbia and so on for other relations. Uh, Albania, it's already happening. Uh, if it works out, uh, there are two long-term effects. For one thing, this region, the Balkans region, will then be part of the b bigger U.S. Greater Middle East system, which is pretty much what it's always been considered. So the Middle East has, includes Greece and Turkey and uh, uh, this area too. This is part of the big system where the U.S. does want unilateral control, oil and everything else. Uh, and also it's a, it's a kind of a wedge towards Eastern Europe. There have been conflicts between the European community and the United States, not only about who's going to run the Balkans, because they'd like to do it, uh, but also about the bigger story of who runs Eastern Europe. Here's this third world opening up. It's actually an old third world, but it's reopening up as a new third world. And the question is, well, who's going to be, you know, who's going to make the profit from it? And the Germans and the Americans have slightly different ideas about that. And it's been conflicted. Uh, and the uh, position of strength in the Balkans gives the U.S. a kind of a leg up on that operation. So one of the, all these are reasons why the Europeans have been very uh, critical and unhappy about the uh, U.S. move. So I, I, it seems to me that's essentially the way it's shaping up. Uh, you could argue it's better than having them kill each other, maybe. Uh, but uh, to call it peace is to degrade a, uh, uh, a worthy word. It's not the only such case. Can you comment on why uh, progressives around the world, and in particular in this country, have failed to mobilize against the U.S. involvement in Bosnia? Uh, is there some principal position that pro progressives can take to, to try to get this message out to the public? Well, I don't mobilize against it either, or even agitate against it. I mean, if you look back a couple of years, there were other options. But that's water over the bridge. The, uh, the options have gradually been narrowed. Over the past years, no one, virtually no one, has suggested anything constructive. There's been a lot of breastfeeding about it uh, and lamenting and talk about the end of civilization and so on. But you have to look pretty hard to find a constructive suggestion. I mean, there are people who say, well, we put a lot of force in there and it'll work out. But, uh, you know, it's not so simple. Uh, the, a constructive proposal I have yet to see. Uh, so we're, and mean, but meanwhile, that's kind of academic because the options have, in fact, been narrowed. Uh, and they've been narrowed by outside force to the point where the, cho the operative choices really now, now pretty much come down to let them fight it out or we'll separate them and partition Bosnia. Well, you know, between those two choices, I don't see anything to agitate for. Maybe the best thing is try to separate the forces. 
in, in a way, it's uh, similar to what the, the other the other big peace process that everyone is celebrating as a great achievement. I mean, if the only options are crush the Palestinians and give them nothing, or crush the Palestinians and give them two cents, well, maybe the second one is the better one. That's the one that's called uh, uh, just peace. Uh, there, in that case, happen to be plenty of other options, but uh, as long as the U.S. runs that region and runs the propaganda system, those other options can't be discussed. So if you ask, for example, would I support the Middle East the peace settlement? Well, you know, given the choice of alternatives that the powers have established, yes. Given a realistic and reasonable set of alternatives, it's, it's horrendous. Speaking of narrow choices and uh, also the good news, bad news, uh, some might argue that the good news is that uh, there, there are going to be national elec elections in the United States coming up soon. Uh, what's the bad news? The bad news is that there's, there's only one candidate with uh, three or four different names you know, uh, and uh, slightly different programs. Uh, so. I mean, if I, right now, if the election were held, personally, uh, I would, with enormous disgust and reservations, vote for Clinton. Not because I expect anything, but because the alternatives are worse. Uh, so there are slight differences, and they, they don't line up very easily, in fact, but they're probably significant. Uh, and uh, however, they're all they are all radically opposed to public will. That we know for sure. It is a very well-polled public. We know very much what people think. And uh, what they think is overwhelmingly opposed by all the candidates. Uh, that goes case by case. Uh, now, you know, I don't know if you bother to copy it, but if you take the other articles the same day and other days about the budget, there's an article about the budget the same day. Uh, and it starts off by saying, well, uh, you know, people, it was debate about, the, in the, this is the New York Times Sunday edition, it said, uh, I think it was either in News of the Week or somewhere, it said uh, there's debate about uh, who's responsible for the budget, budget deficit, and the Republicans are saying this, and the Democrats are saying this, and, you know, they're all wrong, it's in between. You know, there's responsibility all around for this terrible problem that we have to resolve. Well, you know, that formulation, first of all, begs a lot of questions. And secondly, it puts them, it puts the whole spectrum of choices off the spectrum of public opinion. There is, first of all, a question whether the budget's a problem. Well, there are people in the country who think it's a problem. Uh, in the latest poll that the New York Times published, where they asked people what's the biggest problem, domestic problem, 5% uh, picked the budget. That's the same percentage who picked homelessness. So for the public, as a primary problem, it's at the level of homelessness. Uh, when people are asked, do you want the budget, uh, do you want the deficit overcome, here there's two questions, one for the headline writers and another for the people who are trying to figure out how to craft policy. For the headline writers, the question is just what I said, would you like to get rid of the deficit? Well, that's like asking people, would you be happy if all your debts magically disappeared? And people say, sure, you know, it'd be great. Wouldn't have a mortgage, you know, and so on and so forth. And that's for the headline writers. The public wants, you know, deficit overcome. You listen to tune in to All Things Considered on NPR, and they say the public wants the deficit overcome. You know, they voted for a balanced budget and so on. Yeah, you know, that's for them, for the commissar class. That's that question. Then comes the next question, which is the serious one. Uh, would you like to have all your debts eliminated if that meant your house was taken away and your car was taken away and your kids couldn't go to college and so on and so forth? And then the answer is no. You know, I think you can take it away by magic, fine, but not if I have to give up everything. Well, when that question is asked, you get the same answer. If people are asked, would you like to have the budget balanced at the cost of, and then comes any reasonable answer, like cutting back education or medical aid or whatever, then you get overwhelming objection. Uh, so the idea that we must balance the budget and that this is a big problem, that's the idea of the elites. I mean, it's true that investors want that and the business class wants it. So therefore, the press wants it, but the public doesn't. The public's against it. 
Uh, then comes a question about who's right. And in fact, the question about the question that's begged there, like who's responsible for the deficit? Who's responsible for this crime? Well, first of all, is it a crime? I mean, if, if, if you spend, if you take the household example again, if you borrow money and because you want to gamble in Las Vegas, yeah, it's a bad debt. If you borrow money because you want to buy a house or you want to send your kid to college uh, or, uh, or you want to invest in a business maybe, well, it's not a bad debt. It's just debt. It's good debt. You know, it's the kind of debt that gets you somewhere. Now, take a look at the things that they say the various people are responsible for. Well, everyone agrees, incidentally, that 80% of the debt is a Reagan debt, the Reagan years. You know? so, but there's a small part that they say the Democrats are especially responsible for, and that's the social spending, Social Security, Medicare, and so on. Well, are you, does, some, does somebody have to be responsible for that? Is that a crime that you're responsible for? I mean, giving people enough to live on? You know? Is that a crime that somebody has to say, okay, it was my fault, I'm sorry I did it? That's the assumption when you talk about who's responsible for getting us into this hole. Well, it happens that you know, a lot, most of the population feels, and I agree, that that's a very good expenditure of public funds. It's a very good expenditure of public funds to um, have elderly people taken care of. Uh, if they're not taken care of through the tax system, there's going to be a regressive tax. Their children are going to take care of them even if they can't afford it, and they'll sell their homes and so on and so forth. So it's not, you know, nobody's suggesting let's let them die in the streets, or maybe these guys are, but people aren't going to do it. Uh, the same is true of education. Uh, if you put money into education, is that a bad expense? Well, yeah, even on the narrow, I mean, forget any human consideration, even on the narrowest consideration of economic growth, that's a very good expense. I mean, economic growth comes from an educated, skilled population living under decent circumstances with appropriate infrastructure. That's what leads to economic growth, uh, healthy and so on. So all expenditures that build that up, well, you know, that's expenditures that are building up the growth system. In fact, if you look at American history, uh, for well over a century, the U.S. was running big, had a big debt, and it was turning over the debt. It wasn't trying to get rid of the debt. It was turning over the debt by using it for increasing growth faster than debt payment. So that's like a business getting into debt wisely. Gets into debt wisely, uses the debt to invest, makes more money, pays off its debt, and still has something left over. That's sensible debt. Well, what about our current debt and deficit? Which is it? The answer is it's a mixture. I mean, a big part of it is, in fact, just pouring money into the, hands of, into the pockets of Newt Gingrich's constituents like most of the Pentagon budget. All right, that's like gambling at Las Vegas. That was not a total waste, because there's a side effect. You get high tech out of it, but well, there's much better ways to do that. Uh, but it's, it's basically bad debt. Well, that's the part that's going up. Uh, the Pentagon system and the, and, the, and the other security systems are going up. So we're increasing the bad debt. Uh, what about the other things? Well, the good debts, well, they're going down. Uh, so, uh, is this wise to overcome the deficit? Not in this way. I mean, these questions about should we get rid of the debt or deficit are totally meaningless. It's like asking, shall I go into debt? Well, it depends what for. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Well, there's no answer to shall I go into debt. I mean, if, if, say, businesses were told you can't go into debt anymore, the whole economy would collapse. And if families couldn't go into debt, we'd be living in the street. You know? Of course, debt can be very good. In fact, it can lead to uh, not only good for your life, but even good for your economic welfare, because it can be used to create a situation in which you not only can pay off your debt, but you can do more. That's how any system works. That's based on money, at least. Uh, so, uh, how about our present debt and deficit? Is it sort of out of sight? Well, not by historical standards. I mean, with, even with all of this huge Reagan craziness, uh, you know, borrow and spend and forget tomorrow and all that kind of stuff, uh, which did create about 80% of it, even with all of that, it's still not high by historical standards, and it's not high by comparative standards. So in fact, if it is handled wisely, without any crazy budget balancing and so on, it can lead to economic growth and health and a better society and better lives for our children and so on and so forth. But you're not allowed to say that. The discussion is set up. It's framed so that that question can't arise. It's framed on the assumption, yeah, horrible crime, we've got to stop it. That is, it's framed on the assumption set by the investor community, period. Nothing else is in, under discussion.
I think that's probably Bev. Bev? I think that's probably Bev out there telling me this time. Hi. Yeah, we'll be another. Tell Susie I'll be. Okay. Is it Susie? Yeah. Tell her I'll just be in another minute or two. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how much? Well, see, we've been going for about 48 minutes. How much would you like? <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> I'll do another time. Uh, I got a student out there. Uh, if you could go a few more minutes. A few more, but yeah, not okay. too more because I got yeah, a student. Which questions should we ask? Um, I had, well, let's see. Tell me, is this at too high a level of abstraction? You mentioned that this. Uh, Everything you're discussing here uh, is based on a system of money. Can one conceive of a, a system operating without money? Are, are we on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that we're, we're talking about very concrete questions. Uh, can we think about a different social order? Yeah, I think we can think about a very different social order. Uh, getting rid of money is one part of it, which I don't think is the crucial part. Uh, the crucial part is getting rid of uh, tyranny. Uh, we happen to be living in a system which would have driven the founding fathers up the wall uh, and which uh, an, any enlightenment figure like Adam Smith or someone would have found horrendous. It's a, it's a tyrannical system in which power is more and more going into the hands of totalitarian structures which are unaccountable, uh, namely private corporations. The, the, as has long been understood, these are tyrannical structures. They are like totalitarian states. They combine in the command center uh, judicial, uh, legislative, and executive powers. They're pretty much unaccountable to anyone. They're huge in scale by now. They, they, they were created for distorting markets, and they carry out extreme market distortion. Like in, they, they internalize risk. Uh, they, don't, they free participants from market discipline. And they have a million other ways of uh, undermining markets, whether one thinks markets are good or bad. Uh, in any event, these are tyrannical systems which have no right to exist any more than other tyrannical systems. And they have an extraordinary effect over life. I mean, they are the media. When we talk about the media reflecting their interests, that's uh, you know, like saying, I reflect my interests. Uh, yes, of course they do. The, uh, it's not just the media, it's the entertainment industry and you know, advertising and so on. This is all a reflection of a network of private tyrannies. They have an overwhelming effect on government. Uh, they don't like government because government has a defect. It's partially influenceable by the public, whereas GE is not influenceable at all. So, the idea, so they've been trying to create for 50 years, they've been trying to create a mood of anti-politics, you know, hate the government. True, we have the government pretty much by the throat, but it's not totally. Those guys out there can still influence it. So let's get them to hate the government, in particular to hate the federal government. State governments aren't so bad. They're small enough so we can really run them totally. Federal government is fairly large, and you know you can't kick them around too much. Uh, that's the point behind the devolution, getting things down to the state level. Under some circumstances, it might be democratic. Under these circumstances, it's anti-democratic. You move things down to the state level, and even middle-sized businesses can tell them what to do. Uh, it's at the government national level. Well, okay, maybe you know Microsoft and GE, but not small guys. Uh, so let's get power down. Decision when you when you when you take say uh, um, AFDC, any any kind of so-called welfare system, you put it down to the state level. You're guaranteeing that it's not going to go to poor people, because at that level even middle-sized businesses can insist upon regressive fiscal measures and shift in the tax code and this, that, and the other thing, which will mean that the money goes to the rich. Uh, at the federal level, it's harder. You're pushing around the bigger things. So the idea is get re reduce the federal government except for the parts that work for us. Like, and those increase, like the Pentagon, say. So increase that one, because that works for us. But cut down the parts that work for anyone else, go down to the state level, uh, reduce them even further, put even more pr uh, decision making into the hands of private unaccountable power. That's the core of the system. And that's what's got to be dismantled totally. I mean, it has no legitimacy. It comes out of the same intellectual roots as fascism and Bolshevism and ought to be dismantled the same way. Uh, where you go from there, well, you know, there one could discuss. Uh, there are lots of ways in which you could have a democratically run society. Uh, it's worth discussing and thinking about. But the existence of money, it seems to me, is a side part of it.
Uh, maybe money should be part of a decent society. Maybe it shouldn't. I suspect it probably should some form of means of exchange. But it's kind of like a technical question on the side. The real question is tyranny. Um, okay, but not much because they're really waiting for me. Um, along the lines of the uh, along the lines of your last answer, you mentioned Bolshevism. Right now, um, the mainstream media has resurfaced the term uh, anarchism and socialism in a negative light, particularly when it refers to Timothy McVeigh, the the guy who bombed. Uh, the, the building in Oklahoma and the, the Unabomber. Maybe you can give our, our audience some example of what true anarchism and socialism is as compared to what the media is saying. Well, it's a little bit like asking what true democracy is. I mean, it's something that exists in bits and pieces here and there. Uh, there has never been any more than a very partial democracy. There are partially socialist and partially anarchist structures. Like take, for example, one of the most uh, successful industrial commercial installations in, in Spain, quite big, in fact, Mondragon. It's a big collection of industrial works, uh, schools, um, you know, social systems, health systems, and so on. Very substantial, very successful. It's one of the few parts of the Spanish economy that's competitive internationally, even after joining uh, European Union. It's worker-owned, uh, and it's partially socialist anarchist. It's worker-owned but manager controlled. Workers pick the managers, but they theoretically at least control the managers. How much they control them, you can debate. Uh, and, uh, it, it, but in, but the, there's no outside investors telling them what to do. They have their own banks, their own development banks, they have their own social services, and so on. And it's been dramatically successful. Well, okay, that's pieces of a more free and democratic society. Pieces only, because workers are not really participating directly it's, they're still picking somebody to tell them what to do, at least they're picking them, and they have the authority, ultimately, which in principle they could use. Uh, well, okay, that's a piece of a democratic society. Uh, and you find pieces of democratic societies all over the place. Uh, very often in periods of revolution, very democratic societies emerge fast and spontaneously and similarly, like workers' councils to control industry. They come up all the time. I mean, they come up after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. They were immediately crushed by, actually before the Bolshevik Revolution. They developed and they were immediately crushed by Lenin and Trotsky in Italy at the same time. They developed, uh, after the Hungarian Revolution, they developed in Spain. They not only developed, but flourished. Uh, in fact, these things have happened over and over again spontaneously. The reason is it's so natural. You don't have to read big books to think that the workers in a plant ought to get together and run it. In fact, you go back to 19th century America, you know, the mill towns around here, uh, the workers were saying, uh, factory girls, as they called them, young women from the farms or, you know, local craftsmen, the mills ought to be run by the workers who are owned and run by the workers in them. That's just natural. That's like saying that people should vote their own representatives in Congress. Well, okay, those natural ideas are crushed, but there's no reason why they can't be realized and implement. Uh, so yes, and they're all over. You know, so there are lots of, you can, and you can see why there's an effort to defame them, uh, to tie them up with bombers and that sort of thing. Sure, you want to make sure that people don't understand what these things are about. You want to understand that this is the core of the libertarian tradition, American and European. Thanks, Noel. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Those changes would be accompanied by significant reductions in food stamps, Medicaid, housing, and disability programs. And John's going to continue. No, I just want to ask why um, it's so easy for middle class Americans to allow this to continue. Why it's so easy to beat up on the poor, so to speak? Well, first of all, on the quote, the statement that uh, it's a leap of faith is pure propaganda. Uh, nobody has any doubt how it's going to turn out, including the people who are... Uh, 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 I mean, it's as if somebody were to say, when the Nazis put Jews in concentration camps, it was with a huge leap of faith that they would be happier in there. Yeah, maybe somebody talked himself into that, but it's not a leap of faith. They know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the purpose of moving things down to the state level and cutting funds is to ensure that... 
as little as possible gets to poorer people. Well, now, what is it that allows the wealthier sectors to agree to this? Here you have to be a little cautious. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, for these people, it's obvious what it does. They get more money in their pocket. If you're trying to enrich yourself and you want the state to be a powerful welfare state for the rich and nothing else, the Gingrich Heritage Foundation Army system, uh, including our governor, if that's what you want, well, this is fine. I mean, you just uh, crush poor people because they don't do any good for you. It's like uh, social cleansing in Colombia. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the general idea that you have a responsibility to help people, now, like in, as in any propaganda, it's not totally falsified. So an awful lot of foreign aid is putting money in the pockets of rich people. And uh, a lot of what's, I mean, even what they call welfare, which is a very narrow part of welfare, um, you can find welfare fraud and so on and so forth. But, I mean, even the most crazy propaganda, say Hitler's propaganda about the Jews, had, had some fringe of plausibility or else you couldn't get anybody to accept it. Uh, the propaganda is more elaborated in the rest of that story, if I remember it. Uh, it starts by saying that everyone agrees, even liberals, that AFDC has been a total failure. Uh, and that it has uh, not gotten rid of poverty and so on and so forth. Well, that may be what the uh, author of the article and whoever's giving him his lines believes, but it's certainly not a fact that people who know anything should believe, because it's just not true. Uh, the fact is that AF the, what failed about AFDC is that it was eliminated. Uh, AFDC, which was never very high, uh, has been cut back by close to 50 percent since around 1970. You, go, you take a look at AFDC in real terms from 1970 to, say, 1990 through the Reagan years, it's down a, close to half. Uh, in fact, it got to the point where it was lower. Uh, uh, all, all such payments, AFDC food stamps, and I, I forget the third, third one, were lower than general population. Attitudes are somewhat more complicated. For example, a large majority of the population uh, thinks that it's the responsibility of the government to assist poor people who need help. Uh, in fact, a substantial proportion, last time I looked at a poll, it was a majority, are willing to raise taxes uh, to, f to help poor people overseas. So the idea that uh, you should you have a responsibility to help poor people, that's very widespread. On the other hand, uh, the polls also show strong opposition to welfare. So the same people who say it's the responsibility of the government to help the poor uh, are opposed to welfare. And the reason is because there, it sounds contradictory, but it isn't, I don't think, if you look at the propaganda that people are being fed. Uh, the propaganda is that welfare does not go to help poor people. Welfare, welfare goes to uh, keep uh, you know, rich black women breeding like rabbits and driving Cadillacs. Well, I don't want my money to go for that, you know. So yes, uh, I'd like to have money go to help the poor, but not welfare. And similarly with foreign aid. I don't want to give those people money for, you know, rich people who are going to just hate America. If it could go to poor people in Africa, fine, you know. Uh, now here's where the propaganda has been successful in dissociating the actual facts about welfare and aid from the idea. I'm going to start with a bit of humor, not to trivialize matters, but to uh, try to make a point. Uh, there's an old military joke about soldiers being out in the field for six weeks, uh, living in the grime, living in the ditches, unable to shower, unable to change clothes, and they come back to the barracks. They're ordered into the main barracks, and the general comes to the front of the room and says to the soldiers, I have some good news and some bad news. What do you want to hear? Everyone says, the good news. We want the good news. He says, okay, the good news is, today we change underwear. Everybody celebrates, yes, today we change underwear. The bad news is, you change with you, you change with you, <laughs> you change with you. So uh, we, th we thought that a uh, piece of humor is quite revealing about how the whole system of indoctrination works. Uh, we're often
given surface level good news, good news in quotes, and uh, there's a hidden bad news that always accompanies it. And uh, to start, we would like to talk about the war against the poor in the United States uh, in relation to uh, so-called good news and bad news. Uh, there's a quote in the New York Times that says that the Republican plan to abolish AFDC rests on a huge and risky leap of faith. The plan heading for President Clinton's desk would turn over welfare to the states with less money and strict time limits on benefits. Most people could receive no more than five years of aid throughout their lives, and most states would probably set limits much lower. This food stamps alone uh, before this period. So sure, if you cut down support systems for poor people, uh, you're going to have a lot of poor people. That's for sure. Uh, so one factor in the fact that we haven't gotten rid of pro poverty is that the so-called war on poverty was called off right away. Uh, it, in fact, didn't go into effect until the late 60s. And it was, and by the end of Nixon's term, it was over. And Nixon was sort of the last liberal president, you know, uh, even toward the end of his term was being attenuated. But when you get into Carter, Reagan, and so on, that's the end. It just goes down, down, down. So yes, uh, uh, these programs didn't have much effect because they were never applied. Uh, now they had some effect, you know, like some poor children did, did get enough food to eat. Uh, but, uh, uh, and in fact, they were, uh, the, the effect of cutting them down is quite marked, or at least, you know, cause-effect relations are hard to determine, but at least this much is correct. Several years after the decline in welfare, as welfare declines, you know, regularly, steadily, as it has been doing since around 1970, uh, a couple of years later, you get an increase in broken families, child abuse, uh, illegitimate births, and so on and so forth. Now, whether that's a cause-effect relation or a before-after relation, you can argue. But there is a temporal relation, at least, between cutting back of support systems and disruption of families. And that's not, I think you can imagine why that should be. Uh, and it can